As we continue through the Bread of Life Sundays, reading about what happened after Jesus multiplied the loaves, we come to what I like to think of as Sandwich Sunday, because this is where we get the meat of the story. Sorry. I'm not sorry. Suddenly, Jesus switches from talking about loaves and bread to very graphically inviting people to eat his flesh and drink his blood. If you're thinking this sounds weird and disgusting, you're not alone. The Greek words Jesus uses are very specific. Up to now, he's been using the word that we would translate eat. But then he switches to another word here, a synonym, but one that can also be translated chew or munch. It's very mechanical. Then, of course, he uses the word flesh instead of the word meat, which is what we're more accustomed to eating. On top of that, he starts talking about drinking blood, which even in English conjures up images of vampirism or at very least those annoying little pests like mosquitoes and ticks. And leeches. <laughs> yeah, great company, right? But in Hebrew culture, eating blood is completely forbidden. And that's because blood was believed to contain the life force of a creature. And that life belongs only to God. It comes from God and it belongs to God. So any animal slaughtered for food in order to be kosher must have all the blood drained from it before it's butchered so that no blood is accidentally eaten. So the crowd hearing Jesus' words would have been shocked and possibly on the edge of vomiting. So why all the theatrics? Why doesn't Jesus just say what he means, right? I think it has something to do with the message that he's trying to get across. Remember that the first theological question the crowd asks him is what must they do to perform the works of God, right? Perhaps not unlike many of us, these folks have been taught all their lives that, yes, God loves them, that God wants the best for them, absolutely, but that God also requires something from them, requires obedience, requires righteousness, requires adherence to the established tradition. That's the kind of sermon you'd expect to hear in a synagogue or in a church, right? Here's how to live an upright, godly life. Here's what you do in order to be a good person. Well, here's Jesus speaking in the synagogue, and his message is not at all a typical synagogue message. As he starts speaking, people keep hearing what they expect to hear. They keep asking him questions based on those expectations. And the questions we see time and again aren't helpful because Jesus keeps not answering them. What must we do? What works will you perform? Will you give us this bread? How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And so in order to grab our attention, to snap us out of whatever trance we're in, Jesus rhetorically grabs us by the shoulders and shakes us. And this is the message that he wants us to hear. Those who sink their teeth into my muscle and slurp up my blood abide in me, and I abide in them. If you've heard me preach on John's gospel before, you know that abide is one of John's favorite words. He uses it three times as often as all the other New Testament authors combined. This single word is the key to understanding what Jesus has come to teach us about our relationship with God. We have been taught that a good relationship with God, and thus eternal life, depends on right practice, right belief, right living. But Jesus says that God doesn't demand obedience or moral uprightness or unwavering belief. In fact, God doesn't demand anything. Instead, God desires. God desires to abide in us and to have us abide in God. If we can begin to wrap our heads, or maybe more appropriately our hearts, around that concept, then maybe we can begin to see that this life that God has given us is eternal, without limit, without end or beginning. Now, that all sounds nice, right? But the truth is, obedience is a lot more concrete. Religious adherence is a lot easier to understand. We keep trying to translate abiding into the vocabulary that we already have, 
trying to describe how to attain it through religious practice or reducing it to a reward that we get for the works that we do. And that's why Jesus has to get earthy. Abiding is about having Jesus in us somehow and about being in Him, just as He is in the Father and the Father is in Him. It's not an action or an accomplishment. It's a state of being. And what better way to describe how you get something inside you than to talk about eating it? Jesus says to us today, you are what you eat, so eat me and live. As deep as this image of abiding is, what interests me more about this text today is the way that the people respond to Jesus' message. Our disgust isn't just biological, it's theological. We're not just repulsed by the image of cannibalism, but by the idea of a God that can't be appeased or manipulated by doing or believing or practicing the right things. We're made uneasy by a God who wants to be closer than we want to let them be, who refuses to stay confined to an hour on Sunday mornings or some building across town, but who is instead a close talker who sits pressed up against us on the bus even when the next seat over is empty. As we've explored this story, we've recognized our own hunger for the bread of life. And we've talked about how we often try to fill that hunger, usually unsuccessfully. Last week, I suggested that the very thing we want most is what God has already given us, but we can't see it because we can't accept it. Instead, we repeatedly reject and rejigger the gospel of grace to fit our preconceptions of who we expect God to be, reducing God to the feeling that we get in this building because that's the way we like it. We try to make salvation scarce by tying it to religion or spirituality, but meanwhile, God is spreading it around willy-nilly, scattering crumbs from the bread of life all over the place. This pandemic has brought us face to face with the fact that when the loaves run out, the true bread does not. We have finally seen God outside of this building, just as people apart from the church have been seeing God for years. As we consider who we are called to be as a congregation moving forward, I wonder if we're going to take that into account if our hunger for the bread of life will overpower our disgust and our fear of what lies beyond the familiar, whether we'll have the courage and the desire to get into our boats and to row across the sea to find it. You are what you eat, Jesus says to us today. When we come to this place to be fed, I hope we're eating more than just the loaves of worship and hymnody and friendship. I hope that in, with, and under those loaves, we are eating the bread of life, too. And I believe that we are. I believe we are, which is why I keep showing up and preaching and leading worship week after week after week. I think it's why we all keep coming back here. And if we are, then as we become what we eat, this congregation is going to keep growing and changing into what God is creating us to be. Our life will continue to end and begin again, to evolve what it was before, beyond, to evolve beyond what it was before. I know that especially in this season of pandemic, we are afraid for what happens next. We're anxious about our budget, about declining membership, about resources and people that we don't have. We look at these five small loaves and these two tiny fish and we wonder how far they will go. But if we can overcome our fear and our disgust enough to bite into the true food and drink that we receive here, I believe that the eternal life of Jesus will continue to change us. I believe that this congregation will become something different than it is now, something more abundant. In fact, I believe that this is already happening. I've seen it. 
For years now, we've been asking ourselves how to reach out to our neighbors in Gig Harbor as the, as the town continues to grow. That's the hunger. That's the eternal life of Jesus bursting to get out. I see that hunger pushing us in a good direction. I see it moving us toward action. We take a while, but we're getting there. Can we overcome our fear and our disgust long enough to follow that hunger where it leads us? Will we trust it and let it guide us through what is uncomfortable to what is new and exciting? If we are being fed with the bread of life, then there's nothing else we can do. This is inevitable. I said last week that love is who God is, that God saves because God cannot do anything else. To love doesn't just mean to have affection for, right? But to serve and care about and to laugh and cry with and to walk alongside through whatever may come. In other words, to love is to abide. God doesn't just do abiding, God is abiding. Jesus is the physical abidingness of God. When we eat his flesh and drink his blood, he becomes us and we become him. We become the abiding of God. How could we do anything but abide with our neighbors and our community and our world? That's who we are because that's who God is. Our hunger for the bread of life is this hunger to abide, to be fully present with God in one another and with one another in God. To lean into that hunger, that abiding, is what it means, I think, to believe in Jesus. It's not about a head activity of holding certain tenets to be factual. It's not even really a heart activity of having affection for something Believing is something we do with our whole selves, our entire being. Believing is throwing oneself off the cliff so that you can glide on the parachute. Believing is biting into the Son of Man and tearing off a big, juicy chunk of God's abiding presence so that we, too, can abide. Believing is getting past all the norms and the mores and the taboos that guide our daily interactions in order to let love take the lead and then to follow it wherever it goes. And that's scary. It's uncomfortable. Sometimes it's even disgusting or shameful. It's dangerous. But above all, it's eternal and abundant. Abiding is life.